Let's draw the molecular orbital diagram for carbon dioxide. Now, in a previous video, we determined the molecular orbital representations for the carbon and oxygen atoms in carbon dioxide. We have carbon on the left, we have oxygen on the right. Now, you'll notice that the carbon atoms here have a higher energy than the oxygen. That's because oxygen has a, a lower energy for the orbitals or the atomic orbitals on each oxygen. So they're shifted down a little bit. And this is approximately uh, to scale with the orbital energies here. Now, what we'll need to do is start combining these together into molecular orbitals. So let's start with the totally symmetric representation, Ag, from the s orbitals. So here's the s orbital from carbon. Here's the s orbitals from oxygen. Now down here, this is quite low in energy, so there won't be much interaction between uh, this Ag and that Ag, but there will be a little bit and it will have a little bit of bonding interaction there. And so that one's going to come down just a little bit in energy to somewhere right around here. So this will be our Ag orbital from there. And then um, if we look at our Ag orbitals from up here, those will come down a little bit more because this is actually a good bonding interaction since the orbital energies for these are much closer together. These are only, uh, I think about five EV apart. Yes, approximately five electron volts apart. So they have a much better interaction and that will be a bonding interaction right about here. Let's just say And then, of course, there will be a corresponding antibonding interaction. And in general, antibonding uh, has a much larger difference uh, between, you know, the stabilization from a bonding orbital is not as great as the anti-stabilization from an antibonding orbital. So that one is going to go all the way up about here. So this orbital right here is from the 2s orbital on the oxygen. Not much character coming from the carbon atom just because it's quite far in um, energy difference. Now this orbital is coming from the s orbital of the carbon combining, or combining with the 2p orbital on the oxygens to form the sigma bond. And then up here we have these uh, orbitals from the oxygen combining with the orbitals from the carbon in an antibonding fashion to form a sigma antibond. Well, let's uh, move on and finish off the S orbitals on the oxygen now you'll notice that there is a B1U here, here, and there. And so we'll have a little bit of stabilization effect, but since um, this orbital, the B1U from the uh, carbons 2PY orbital is much higher than, than this one, the effect of orbital mixing will not be as great. See, this orbital right here can push this Ag down just a little bit more 
and we also don't have as good of a bonding interaction. So it just barely shifts down in energy from where it is in the S. Just a little bit down. Now we have come up to here. We have a B1U here and we have one there. And we also have the interaction from this. So that is a sigma bond. Not quite as symmetrical as the AG. And so since it has a few more nodes, it's a little bit higher up on our chart. So there's the another sigma bond in between the um, carbon's PZ orbital and the oxygen PZ orbital. So, so far we've taken care of the bonding interactions from this. Now we need to talk about the antibonding interaction. And since there are more nodes, in fact, it'll have the highest number of nodes, it will have the highest energy. Right up here. So we have the carbon um, PZ combining with the oxygen PZ in an antibonding fashion to make an additional sigma antibonding orbital way up top. Now we need to go over the pi interactions because so far we've covered all of the direct overlap sigma interactions. Now if we see here there's a B3U and a B2U and there's a B3U and a B2U. So this is from our X and Y orbitals in either the carbon or the oxygen. And since these orbitals are degenerate, they have the same energy here, combining with orbitals of the same energy there, there will be a pair of orbitals at the same energy right here to form the pi bond. And that will look something like this right around here. So this is our B3U. And then our B2U. Right there beside it. And then we'll have a corresponding antibonding orbital. But remember, pi interactions are not as strong as sigma interactions. There's not as much stabilization from bonding, and correspondingly, there won't be as much antibonding or destabilization, just because the overlap is not as um, direct. So when we come up here, we'll have our antibonding pi orbitals right about here, say. So there's our pi antibonding, still underneath our um, sigma antibonding interactions. Now we've almost taken care of all the orbitals uh, that we have here. There's just a couple left. Now you'll notice that B2G and B3G have no matching orbitals on the carbon. And so there's nothing uh, that could change its orbital energy because there's no interaction over here. So those are our non-bonding orbitals. And so they simply just stay the same energy right here. So there's our B2G and B3G. These orbitals are from our PX and PY um, atomic orbitals. So 
here's the skeleton of the molecular orbital diagram. Now we could start filling it in with electrons and see where all of our electrons are and what the bond orders are and everything. So let's see what happens when we do that. Uh, carbon has four valence electrons. So there's two, there's four, and the oxygens each have um, six valence electrons. And so I should put in um, 12 on this side. There's four. So there's 12. And then we can start filling in our orbital diagram with them. And you just start from the bottom and fill up until you're done with electrons. So we have a total of 16 electrons to fill in. So one, two, three, four. So all of these orbitals right here will be full, and there should be no antibonding interactions. Just like that. So from this, we can see that there are two very good sigma interactions, bonding interactions, and then two pi bonding interactions, which is exactly what we should expect based on if we were to draw a Lewis structure of this molecule. And we would also notice that there are some lone pairs now, realistically, there are a couple lone pairs right here. These are not bonding with anything. And if you were drawing a Lewis structure, you might miss that some of these electrons down in the S orbital on the oxygen do participate a little bit in bonding, but are definitely mostly on the oxygen atoms. So this would be included in a lone pair in a Lewis structure, but it misses that finer point of there is a little bit of bonding with this um, AG especially that a Lewis structure would just not really fully explain. Now as far as what kind of bonds we should expect and how a carbon monoxide would react in a reaction, that could probably be explained with a Lewis structure, but this is um, a little bit more in depth about that so that we can examine what this actually looks like on a relatively simple molecule. So that is the molecular orbitals of carbon.